Um, so let's set our motivation and we'll use the Heart Sutra and really try and think about the meaning and connect with the meaning. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagawan was dwelling on mass of Vultures Mountain in Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara looked at the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also is empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form, emptiness is not other than form, form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors and consciousness are empty. Shariputra likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to the unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is proclaimed. Taya ta hum gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhisoha. Shariputra, a bodhisattva, mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like this. Then the Bhagawan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva, mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagawan having thus spoken, the Venerable Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, asuras, and gandavas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagawan. And so sitting with that,
Okay. Yes. <laughs> so we're gonna review a little bit from Wednesday just so you're not lost. So there were the two things that we talked about last week and um, in prior weeks. So the main thing um, that we should finish with for now, not you know finish cosmically, but finish for now is ignorance, avoiding the two extremes specifically. So the ignorance avoiding the two extremes, um, I think should be clear, but let's make sure. And then we're gonna look into this subtlest level of dependent arising. What is it to merely label and what is a valid base? So before we get into dependent arising, the ignorance avoiding the two extremes. What are the ignorance? <laughs> what is the ignorance um, that does not avoid the two extremes? What is the ignorance that goes into one extreme or the other? What are the two problems? Yep. Yep, nihilism and eternalism. Yep, exactly. And uh, do you have like a, a nutshell, a short description of what is nihilism, just in brief? What's that extreme nihilism? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Then nothing exists. Then what is the extreme of eternalism? Things have permanent uh, essential uh, existence. Uh, not quite. Not quite. Close. Easy to get confused because it's sometimes called the extreme of permanence, but it's not talking about permanence because there is permanent things, remember? So the extreme of permanence is not really talking about permanence. It's talking about an aspect of permanence. Um, so permanent things don't rely on causes and conditions. So that's kind of related to why we use that terminology. Much easier is to use the terminology eternalism or absolutism, um, but you'll find the extreme of permanence in lots and lots of texts, which is why I include it. Um, but what is it just kind of in a nutshell, not talking about permanence, what's the extreme view on that side? If one side is nothing exists, then the other side is existing how? Yeah, from its own side. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, these are hopefully relatable in the sense of when you get stuck in your daily life, when you see your parents and your family members and your children, you know, getting stuck, that there's something in their worldview that's like clogged or stifled or the creativity is lost because they're thinking that things don't exist at all or they're thinking that things exist from their own side in and of themselves or some like variation of those two that's not quite as extreme but has like shadows of it and we don't usually frame things in those ways but those are the two really problematic directions that our mind goes in and it goes in those two directions because of ignorance so the middle way that we're always talking about the middle way the middle way it's the middle way between those two extremes which is not like reconciling those two extremes. It's neither of those two extremes. So, you know, emptiness is empty because it dependently arises, just like everything dependently arises. How do things dependently arise? Those three levels that we keep talking about, dependent on causes and conditions, parts and whole and context, mere designation on a valid basis. Is that like snapshot of information somewhat clear enough to process by yourself? Or do you feel like you're missing some links or some pieces? You can say again the question. The, the question is, do you understand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yes. So, um, so I'll just give you a, sh a summary of the two extremes, just like bringing it all together, and then we'll move on and look at the subtlest level of understanding dependent arising, that mere designation on a valid base. Okay. So um, avoiding the two extremes, this is done through negation. This word negation means like canceling or contradicting or disproving. And the word negation you'll see in Buddhism a lot because of our relationship to logic. So I know in Judaism, there's a system of logic that, um, that spiritual practitioners go through to help understand this or that philosophical point. Buddhism is the same. We have philosophical tenets that we then argue through using logic and reasoning. So negation is a term from logic texts. And so you'll keep seeing it. And whenever you see it, just know that it means it's canceling through logic. So avoiding the extremes is done through negation of the two main errors, negating the extreme of permanence, negating the extreme of annihilation. Annihilation or nihilism the nihilistic view holds that phenomena do not exist, or if, or if they do exist, then causality does not. Instead of meditating on things being empty of true existence, a person with this view meditates on things being non-existent. And so this leads to no ethics or leads to despair or leads to apathy or leads to hedonism. Um, you know, maybe psychopaths, maybe sociopaths, maybe there's a type of nihilism kind of underpinning their worldview. So this erroneous view, meaning wrong, this erroneous view comes about through searching for the imputed object in its spaces of designation, not finding it, and then drawing the erroneous conclusion, the wrong conclusion, that the object does not exist at all. That person incorrectly believes that meditating on emptiness means meditating on phenomena not existing at all. And this is a very heavy wrong view. And so there is, um, a reason why people who have philosophical tenets might slide the wrong direction. One of the meditations that we do is to search for the eye, right? So you're searching for the eye, searching for the eye, you know, you're sitting there asking, am I my body? Am I my name? Am I my nationality? Am I my gender? Am I my sexuality? Am I my socioeconomic status? Am I my intelligence? Am I this? Am I this? Am I this? And you're looking at all the things related to your physicality and you find there is no inherently existent body in, in the way that it seems. And then you look at the mind and you see all the different pieces of the mind and you see that none of them are the boss. It seems like there's a boss mind and then little like pieces of mind that kind of go off in different directions and the boss tells them what to do. And that's not true. They're all interrelated to each other and bouncing off of outside and inside and karma and no core. So a meditator might do this examination and find no self when in fact there is no inherently existent self but there is a conventionally existent self. So it's like they take a good process that's very useful, this like dissection and unpacking and looking at projections. And because they don't find a core, they think there's nothing. Does it make sense? Right, so they're going, you know, they're going along maybe okay. And then it just slips off the deep end. So it would be easy for, um, I think, people prone to depersonalization, people prone to disassociation, people prone to depression, to fall into this. Um, and so it's, it's a danger that we wanna be aware of. And of course, lots of well-intended new age practitioners 
who do some maybe cultural appropriation or religious appropriation say, okay, now everyone meditate on emptiness, empty your mind, and they equate them as if they're the same thing. You know, complete misunderstanding. And I'm sure before you came to Buddhist classes, you heard this misunderstanding that meditating on emptiness meant to empty out your mind, right? Or to like blank out into some like blissful haze of relaxation, right? There's a lot of that misunderstanding. So, so it's very important that we understand what is nihilism as opposed to negating inherence. The other one is a little bit less problematic. So the extreme of permanence refers to absolutism or eternalism. And this is from Insight into Emptiness by um, Geshe Jumpa Tichok. And he says, the other extreme is the view of absolutism, permanence or eternalism. Again, remembering permanence has a different meaning in this context. Here, a person also errs in thinking that if things are empty, they don't exist at all. Unlike the nihilist, adherence to this view say that there has to be something that exists from the side of the object. And phenomena are self-existent. So this is also a big mistake but it's not as bad as falling into the extreme of nihilism. So all the lower schools of Buddhism hold this absolutist view, which thinks there's a little bit of something that exists from its own side, that they acknowledge projection, but they still think there's a little bit of something like out there. So if there is a choice between falling into the extreme of nihilism, thinking that nothing exists and falling into the extreme of absolutism, thinking phenomena exist from their own side, it would be better to fall into the extreme of absolutism. On the basis of thinking there is something findable from the side of the object, someone will still do like purification practices, accumulate merit, listen to teachings, meditate, Eventually doing these activities, his mind will develop and he will start to wonder if things really exist in the way he assumes them to. At that time, he will be better prepared to meditate on emptiness and realize that things are completely non-existent from their own side. Okay, so just when you see those two, do you have questions or kind of interesting insights? Yeah. Uh, about the eternalism, you said that uh, uh, the lower school think that uh, something exists. What is it? The this something. Um, they they have different views. They don't all agree on what it is exactly. Um, some of the schools believe that there is a mind basis of all. So that there is like a core part of the mind where everything comes from. So like the mind only school don't believe in external objects. Our school, the middle way consequence school do believe in external objects. We just don't believe that external objects exist from their own side inherently, but they do exist. You know, you can bump your knees on a table. It's there. But you know from quant right, so you know from quantum physics, et cetera, that you know, if you look at the particles, mostly it's space. And if you keep looking deeper and deeper and deeper, when is matter become waves and all that interesting conversation? That's very much like the middle way consequence school view. Some of the other schools believe mind inherently exists. Some of them believe matter, the partless particle. Remember that conversation inherently exists. So they have different views about it. And I think, you know, for our purposes, we could go into all of the details of all of the tenant schools, but I think that it would be the type of detail that wouldn't really interest you. I think just knowing the subtlest view and then some of the other views, 
I mean, we spend years studying tenants. Um, I think for your purposes, it's really interesting to look at what do you as an individual do when you feel self-righteous, when you feel strong opinions, when you feel certainty that is kind of agitated or um, concrete. You know, when you feel challenged, what is it that's challenged? Because there is this part that feels like there is something that's kind of alone by itself that then reaches out and connects to other things or that other things reach out and connect to, but there's like this little core. That's how it feels. And that's an illusion. So it's worth looking for and finding the not finding. And then not going too far and thinking that finding the not finding means that there's nothing because that's too far. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, there are different schools of psychology that are talking about what like an authentic self or an integrated self or a cohesive self. What are they talking about? What are you guys talking about when you talk about the self? What do you mean? A, like a cohesive self? That's, those are words you guys talk about a lot. What do you mean by that? Okay. Yes. Can I ask you if I understand something about you? It's about your question also, but does it mean that the two extremes think that there is only conventional world or only ultimate world? Like, it's not the same terminology, but uh, yeah. think, no. It's, it's, almost, it's almost, I would like yeah. it if it was that tidy. <laughs> I would like that. But um, no, they don't. I mean, their discussion of what the relative and the ultimate means is also very varied. But they're not, some of them believe that ultimate existence exists inherently, you know, yeah. they go into that whole tangent, but no, um, it's, they either believe there is nothing or there is essential something. Yeah. So then what doesn't fit in is the permanence of the emptiness, right? Which is not here and not there. And I, I mean, uh, uh, in addition to negation, we can say what there is, mm -hmm. right? Which is not only the middle way between them, it's something else, not? It's There are, you know, okay, so like imagine an umbrella, right? Mm -hmm. At the top of the umbrella is like all phenomena, everything in the whole world, everything that exists, everything that doesn't exist, everything is empty of inherent existence. Then you go down and make a branch. There are permanent things that are empty of inherent existence and impermanent things that are empty of inherent existence. Permanent things is not many things, right? There are like emptiness itself doesn't change moment to moment, but what the thing is empty of does. But you know, while it's existing, related to something, it doesn't change moment to moment. So, you know, permanent doesn't always mean eternal or forever, but it means while it exists, it doesn't change. So there are a few things that are permanent, emptiness, space, like uncompounded space. You know, there's a few things and they're not usually that important. They're not the troublemakers. Um, then you have impermanent things which we divide into like form or matter, consciousness, and non-associated composites. And this was all kind of when we did our mind semesters a few semesters ago. So um, things that are impermanent are divided into three, matter, consciousness, non-associated compositional factors. 
And the non-associated composites, an example would be a person because a person is labeled on the basis of matter and consciousness, right? Or form, even if it's very subtle form, like the wind energy, the bardo being rides on and mind. Matter, we, at, these days we look to scientists to explain how matter works and interacts and how biology happens and the environment and the discussion of matter these days is very much similar to biology and science in general. The study of consciousness then gets divided into minds and mental factors or the seven types of awareness or all those different divisions of mind, right? So you have all phenomena are empty of inherent existence. Then permanent ones are also empty. Impermanent ones are also empty. Let's talk more about impermanent ones because those are the ones we have more control over. Are you lost with me? Say again. Yeah, emptiness is just a mere negation of inherent existence. For something to be empty of inherent existence, you have to refer to something. Even if you're just referring to emptiness itself, emptiness itself is empty of inherent existence. But emptiness isn't existing, divorced from something, right? So a person is empty of inherent existence. The emptiness of the person isn't changing because it's a negation. But the person is changing moment to moment to moment. And if the person dies, then the emptiness of a person with that name finishes, right? So it's, you know, it, it takes a minute to kind of let it sink in. But once it sinks in, you go, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's just a quality or an attribute. It's just a description. One of the many descriptions you could put on a person. A person is labeled on a body and mind. A person is labeled on the five aggregates. A person is empty of inherent existence. You know, it's just like in the series of labels, emptiness is one. And emptiness is the one that is talking about the person's ultimate truth. Does that help or make it more confusing? Empty, why? Empty because dependent. What is what confusing to me is uh, thing you say about consciousness that there is very, very low I can't quite hear you, Mika. I'm so sorry. Are you asking if consciousness exists even when it's subtle? I can't quite hear you. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Some, some... Hi. <laughs> hey. Hi. I, no, I, I, I'm, I was wondering because what's still confusing for me is this concept of consciousness in, his, in its subtler level. Mm. Yeah. And is, is that subtler level empty? Is... If, if it's something that continues. So right. How... Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good question. It's a good question. So consciousness, um, course consciousness gross consciousness is kind of our everyday experience of like eye, ear, nose, tongue, body. And then mind is kind of slightly subtler, but you know, we have eye consciousness, which then works through our eyeball, right? So the physical thing is not the consciousness, but the consciousness uses it, right? So you can have eye consciousness, even if you're blind, you can have ear consciousness, even if you're deaf. Okay, so that's one level. Then you have like the subtler level, like dreams or meditation 
or, you know, just kind of different, slightly more subtle mental experience. And then you have extremely subtle, right? So we have coarse, subtle, extremely subtle. Extremely subtle is only felt or experienced in brief split seconds throughout your lifetime and then longer at the time of death. And it's that fundamental consciousness, that primary consciousness, that clear and knowing very subtle form that carries karma and that goes from life to life to life. The, the coarser levels, it's like they absorb or they like fall asleep into the subtle consciousness. They're not manifest. This is the word we use. They're not manifest at the time of death. They kind of absorb into. And that fundamental consciousness carries the ability to like pop into subtle and coarse, right? It, but it like, you know, those qualities kind of shrink into it. But that fundamental consciousness lasts forever and is what eventually develops into complete enlightenment. Does that, does that make sense? So it's not permanent, no, it changes moment to moment, but it lasts forever. That, that's why I keep telling you the definition of permanent because it's not like in English, right? Permanent means non-momentary, doesn't change. Impermanent means changes, but the thing that changes could last forever. Yeah, it's just changing while it exists, moment to moment to moment. So the characteristic of emptiness isn't changing moment to moment. It's a characteristic that remains together with that impermanent thing that is changing. So the mind is changing moment to moment, the substantial cause of the mind, the previous moment of mind. Right, so that moment of mind gives rise to this moment of mind, to this moment, to this moment, to this moment, like a river. And like a river, when it changes countries or it changes bodies, it gets a new name sometimes, but it's the same continuity of consciousness or the same stream of water. But the whole time, you can say it has the quality of clarity and reflectivity or the whole time it has the characteristic of lacking inherence. So oh, the clarity is permanent, you can say? No. It changes, yeah, it changes. Yeah. There are, there are very few things that are permanent and it's, you know, it's not such an important point. It's, it's more talking about things that change and things that don't change. Kind of get rid of the normal idea, the normal idea of permanent and impermanent, and think things that don't change, things that do change. Not lasting or not lasting. Yeah, because in Buddhism, we're using these words slightly differently. We just don't have a better word. Yeah. We understand. So some permanent things are eternal, some permanent things aren't. It's just while they live, they don't change. How is it related to emptiness? The permanence of emptiness? And then yeah, I mean, permanence is empty of inherent existence. Impermanence is empty of inherent existence. The extreme of permanence is referring to eternalism, absolutism. It's not referring to the general concept of permanence, right? And so when you're looking at emptiness, you always look at dependent arising. The first level of dependent arising, relying on causes and conditions, doesn't apply to permanent things. Permanent things don't rely on causes and conditions. Yeah, they're not produced. They're not disintegrating moment to moment, but permanent things do rely on or depend on parts, even space, right? There's the left side of space and the right side of space and up and down, right? Emptiness relies upon parts, whole and context, meaning the thing that it's 
you know, attributed to has parts, context, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then permanent things also depend on mind and um, a valid basis to label. So can't you say that clarity is not dependent on uh, causes, causes and conditions? Clarity, the content of clarity is always changing, but the concept of clarity is not dependent on, on causes and conditions. It's, it's similar to what you're saying, but I mean, it's, it's like really take the water analogy, even if the water is perfectly clear and perfectly still, it's still changing moment to moment, even if it's not moving. Yeah, so the relative nature of the mind is that it's clear and knowing. The ultimate nature of the mind is that it's empty of inherent existence. So the clarity aspect is a remaining aspect of the mind. It's a characteristic of the mind the whole time the mind exists. So colloquially in English to say permanent would make sense, just not from a Buddhist context. Yeah, are, are you getting the distinction between how you use the word normally and how we use the word in English? So the impermanent and permanent conversation is an old conversation. It's not a conversation that we bring into the tenants discussion, except just to refer to it, right? So don't get lost and think that nihilism and eternalism are referring to impermanent and permanent in a tidy kind of column. That's, that's not what's happening. Or that permanent and impermanent are referring to relative truth and ultimate truth. No, they're, they're not in those tidy columns like that either. It's a whole kind of separate conversation that we, you know, tap into because it's relevant sometimes, but it's not the main content of this particular semester. It just comes up because the different tenant schools have different beliefs about what things change and what things don't. And it's important because it's pulling us into the idea of what's incorrect about our view of the self. And one of our most coarse incorrect views is that we think that the self is permanent, unitary, and partless. That's the coarsest view that we hold about ourselves, right? Permanent, unitary, or one without parts. Yeah, so we are empty of being permanent, unitary, and partless. We're not that. We're also empty, then you go more subtle, right? And we're also empty of being self-sufficient and substantially existent. We're not self-creating. There's not like a tiny yintin making new moments of yuntin, like a manufacturer in an assembly line saying, let's give her new cells, let's give her new brain pathways. There's no you know, self-sufficient, substantially existent self. And then there's most subtle, there is no inherently existent or truly existent self from its own side. So if I was to say to you, what is the self that does exist and what's the self that doesn't? What would you say? What is the one that exists? Existing self that changes from from moment to moment, and I think we investigate this in with our clients, and we see how uh, things are connected and uh, dependent on a lot of cause and condition. Yeah, that's one level. Yeah, can you go even more subtle? What's the subtlest self that does exist conventionally? Again? Merely labeled. Merely labeled. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the self, yes. The self that does exist is the self that is merely labeled on the body and mind. Yeah. The self that doesn't exist is then what? The one that doesn't exist at all, not even conventionally, absolutely false. What's that self? 
exactly yeah the inherently existent self exactly just making sure i know that you know we talk about it a lot but we'll make sure we don't lose the basics so then what appears to us is opposite to what is what appears to us is the inherently existent self who we think we are is the inherently existent self we never touch the merely labeled self. We never have experience of that most subtle form. We will eventually, but we haven't yet. So everything you really hold to be true of you is just dependently arisen. It's not you. It landed here, <laughs> right? You collected it, you know, like, I don't know, a bag of seeds. You just kind of pop them in, you know, but you weren't the one doing it by yourself. Maybe more like when you're a little kid and you have a magnet and all the little pieces of iron and you're playing with the magnet and the little pieces of iron get stuck to it and they make a shape. Then to say that shape made itself all by itself would be an exaggeration. But the, the danger is that uh, we, we might think that um, there is no meaning to the set or to the action or to the um exactly that's the extreme of nihilism right so it's it's just like what we were talking about before you do that investigation and then you go too far and then think then there's nothing so so it's it's really easy to do isn't it you start unpacking things and go all oh, right i'm only this within this context and that within that context so who am i nothing you know and it's like no no you're still you know you're still you just merely labeled on the collection which is merely labeled on a collection on a collection on a collection on a collection Right. Because we want our our matama and our goal to to hold lightly the light. Yeah, hold lightly. Exactly. And also help help to choose to make better or ethical choices or be free of the. Or, uh, what was put on, like, yeah, it's it's like you have to you have to land on a conclusion and land on an identity and then let it go. And then land and then let it go. But you can't never land or you can't function, right? You can't function in the conventional world. So this is where we see with mental health issues, if there's something about you that society hates or society praises, that somehow becomes the identifying feature. Before it was just one of millions of parts with no particularly more significance than anything else. But when a society starts to demonize or elevate, it becomes a defining characteristic. Or when a family has an expectation of yourself to be a certain way that your karmic habituation doesn't go into easily, that friction creates like an identity stuckness of I should be this, I can't be this, I don't want to be this, who am I without this? And it becomes a huge issue, right? So we're not saying that those aren't facts of life that we all need to kind of investigate. It's almost like you need to know yourself so well conventionally before you can let go of identity. You know, if you don't know yourself well, you can't release. So a lot of the work that we're trying to do is to say, oh yeah, I'm this way and I'm that way and I get this way because of that and this is from my mother and this is from my father and this is from my society and here I am not. <laughs> but you have to say, here I am for a few minutes <laughs> or for a pause. Here I am and then not. Right now, here I am right now. But in a moment, I am something else. So it's just you don't want the I am to feel permanent or self-creating. Yeah. 
So on a relative sense, you are making your own choices and developing with free will, but ultimately it's far more complicated than that, which is why praise and blame of oneself is an exaggeration because you're identifying with something that isn't yours. It just is something that happens here in the space you're responsible for. Yeah, but we take... Hmm. I'm asking about ethics. What is and, and decision? We, we, we decisions. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, ethics, decisions, karma are all in the realm of the relative and are vital, right? We have to have ethics. But we have to have ethics for a different reason than what we thought. We have to have the ethics of non harmfulness because it makes sense, because of interconnection, because of dependent arising, right? Not because having ethics makes me a good person or because a good person does good things in this kind of moralistic, simplistic, childlike way. Ethics become the only reasonable conclusion because of infinite interconnection, you know? And so, you're not going to take your fist and hit your other fist because it hurts this fist and that hurts the whole system, which comes around and in some way hurts the very thing that started it, right? Or if I cut this hand, this hand goes to comfort it. This hand doesn't say, hey, oh, I'm so bad for needing to be comforted. And this hand doesn't say, I always help you. Why don't you help me? I'm always the strong one. It's ridiculous, right? Because there's an acknowledgement that this is a system that's connected. And that's the way all of everything is, is like a system that's connected. But the problem is, is that we see the distinction of left hand and right hand and think that that's an inherent duality and that they're two detached, unrelated things, right? Or that we think me and you are two detached, unrelated things when we're as connected as our two hands, this right? Dualism, right? This is what you say, dualism. Yeah, the dualism sees the two hands and thinks that they're inherently separate or sees two people and thinks that they're inherently separate. It sees self and other and then makes it concrete. But even the seeing of self and other is a symptom of dualism. But, you know, so that's why we're peeling back layers and layers and layers to get to infinite potentiality. So emptiness is that space of infinite possibility. It's not the space absent and empty in a like void way, right? It's like the raw potentiality, which then takes this form or this form interdependently. You can still hold the concept of uh, cohesiveness, but think of it as uh, the total, it's a total cohesiveness that you will yeah. hold yeah. Uh, the world. You are part of all, all, all things in the world. So you are, it's a cohesiveness, but it includes everything. Yeah, like cosmic, cosmic cohesiveness, right? You say cosmic narcissism, cosmic cohesiveness, <laughs> right? And I, I mean, you need a basic cohesiveness in order to function. It's just the problem is that then we stay there. Like I have found my authentic self or I have resolved all of my issues or I have integrated or I've become cohesive and now I am who I was always meant to be. Like, what does that even mean? You know, and we take that as like, and now we're done. <laughs> and, you know, most people don't think now I'm done. They see this as a lifelong process of becoming cohesive and integrating and whatever. You know, we don't usually define things so simplistically. But there is this kind of idea in our head that there's like a finished product version of ourselves, you know, like, I don't know, Maslow's hierarchy at the top or something silly. These kind of ideas get stuck in our head. Like there's a self to find. Yeah. 
a better version this is, this is of ourselves. You hear, you hear what, the, what she said? No, tell me. No, a better version. version of ourselves. A better version. A better version. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's like, sure, that's worthwhile, but that's still not the self. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's a more ethical, there's a kinder, there's a more wise version of yourself. That's still not like the core. That's just a good project. It's just a, a question of, of logic. This is what you say. No core, only logic. Yeah, maybe. When you say a merely labeled I, how, how is it connected to the consciousness? The merely labeled I. How is the merely labeled I? Subtle consciousness. Um, are you asking how is the merely labeled I the subtle consciousness or labeled on the subtle consciousness? Yeah. Second one. Oh, yeah. Oh. Both. Both. <laughs> um, the merely labeled I isn't the subtle consciousness. The merely labeled I is attributed to it. It's a really important but very subtle point. So the fundamental consciousness is still a basis. It's not the thing. Possessor and possessed, right? So the very fundamental consciousness is still a mind and it still has a body. It's just a subtle wind body. And so it's still just merely labeled on the five aggregates. It's just some of the aggregates are sleeping or in a more subtle form, right? So to say, what do we label self on? We label self on the collection of body and mind. What is body and mind? The five aggregates, right? Form, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, consciousness, right? Yeah, so the subtle consciousness is, it's just... It's a very logical place for us to stop this investigation and it's still not far enough. You know, it seems like that would be the place to stop and say, okay, the I is that most subtle consciousness. And some of the tenant schools believe that. Some of the Buddhist tenant schools, they, they go, you know, through dependent arising and they get to thinking, okay, mere designation, but what is it merely designated on? There has to be something to land on. Let's land on the subtle consciousness, <laughs> right? Or the mind basis of all. So that is the, the view of some of the tenant schools. The middle way consequence school says, excellent, go a little further. And even that lacks inherent existence. Because it's still, there's a basis and a label. And the basis and the label can't be the same thing. Can they, right? Like the basis for labeling a table isn't the table, is it? Right, the basis for labeling the table are the parts of the table and how the table came about, right? And the ability to label it and all of these different things, right? The basis can't be the thing. So the fundamental consciousness can't be the self. It's the basis for labeling self. What is the basis? The fundamental consciousness is the basis for the label. The basis of the table is what is it? Parts of the table. Parts, yeah, parts. Only parts? No, no, everything, right? Causes and conditions, parts and context, mere designation on a valid basis. It's not like table, tables aren't different than people is my point, right? <laughs> they are different to people, but not in the way that they are dependent. It's just the details are different. I ask the, the basis, you, you call it fundamental consciousness? Uh, the fundamental consciousness or the extremely subtle consciousness, it's just the most subtle level of consciousness when we're talking about consciousness. And so all of those levels are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. The subtlest form seems like a likely place to stop our investigation of what is the self 
when in fact that's still just a basis for labeling self. There's not like a core self creator with that fundamental consciousness. Also, I've parts. The subtle, yeah, there's yeah, the there's parts. The subtle level also has uh, parts. Yeah, yeah. Even if they're just momentary parts, like temporal in the sense of time, like the previous moment, like this moment depends on the previous moment. Those are you know parts in terms of time. Yeah. So they don't have to be physical parts, right? They don't have to be concrete matter to be parts. They can also be temporal parts. All right, so sit with it <laughs> and um, we'll, we'll dedicate. We'll dedicate. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer commit evil or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with the mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be free. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the misery of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Avo avoid the two extremes, okay? <laughs> <laughs>